Good afternoon and welcome to this online seminar. Uh, my name is Pierre Schlosser. I'm the scientific coordinator of the Florence School of Banking and Finance. And it's a real pleasure for me to welcome you to today's online seminar on the EU banking package, which, as we'll know, has been adopted recently. So I'm very glad to welcome our speakers of today. Uh, Marie Donnet, head of unit in resolution and deposit insurance at DJ FISMA European Commission. Tommy uh, de Temerman, policy officer in bank regulation and supervision also at DGFISMA, and Audrius uh, Prankevicius, policy officer in resolution and deposit insurance also at DGFISMA. Marie, Tommy, and Audrius, if you allow me to call you by your first name, thank you uh, to all of you for being with us today live from Rue de Spa. Uh, we have experienced a few uh, technical uh, delays, uh, so apologies for that. Uh, but I hope that the connection is going to be now uh, stable again. Many thanks also to my colleague Jan, who has prepared the seminar. Um, and before telling you more about our audience, so I, what I'd like to do is to inform you about our school's upcoming activities, as I'm sure that some of them will be of interest to you or to your colleagues. Uh, you will know by now that the Florence School of Banking and Finance, FBF, in short, is a non-national training platform, which is part of the European University Institute, a public intergovernmental research and education institute. Our School of Banking and Finance is a recently launched program of the EY. It boasts a diversity of policy debate and training activities, meaning that our online seminars are only one of the many activities and services that we offer. Our ebook of this year on the European financial infrastructure, for example, will be out in late August and will feature a variety of insightful contributions on extraterritorial sanctions, debt restructuring, and the European safe asset debate. Uh, all those contributions are made by leading policy makers, scholars, and private practitioners. It will be available for free as our past ebooks on our website. On the executive education side of things, our school has been training more than 2,300 participants coming from 70 countries and a variety of organizational affiliations since its creation in 2016. Trained institutions include uh, the European Central Bank, uh, BBVA, the bank, the Bank of Korea, and law firm Loyens and Loew, among many, many others. Our course on the economics of insurance markets with Ralph Kogen uh, from the University of Chicago uh, is just closing as we speak. However, we have a series of other courses lined up for after the summer which may be of interest to you or uh, your colleagues. Uh, concretely, we'll offer courses on macroprudential policy uh, at the end of September with Professor Enrique Mendoza from the University of Pennsylvania. We'll have a course on valuation in derivative markets with Professor McDonald from Kendall School of Management and Fabrizio Planta from ESMA. We'll have a course also on prudential risks and policies in the European insurance sector with instructors from IOPA, ESRB, and the National Bank of Belgium. Last but certainly not least, giving the audience of this online seminar on 4 to 6 November 2019, we'll host a dedicated course on own funds, MRL, and TILAC. In this course, led by Professor Christos Gortzos and Seraina Grunewald, the required levels, quality, composition, and pecking order in loss absorbency of own funds and other loss absorbing instruments will be analyzed, both from a theoretical and a practical perspective. The course will also address issues uh, leveraging on past experiences, the ongoing academic and policy debate, but also will engage with recent regulatory developments, including the recent uh, package. As a general rule, I'd like to invite you not to wait for the last moment to register to our courses if you'd like to be guaranteed a seat. Uh, of course, you can find more details on our activities on our website and on our LinkedIn page, which has taken a new life for the past, over the past months and where you will be able to follow the school's weekly podcast, for example. So do have a look there. Right, so I guess it's time to thank you for your patience and, and to introduce you to one another. Since you don't see each other, I will present you uh, to one another briefly. You are around uh, 215 participants connected today following us from almost everywhere in Europe and from several other continents. 50 nationalities are represented. We are very glad to count on several participants from the Single Resolution Board, the European Central Bank, uh, the Commission, ESMA, the Austrian Financial Market Authority, as well as from several national central banks, law firms, and private banks. But of course, let me welcome all the remaining participants from the other organizations listed and not listed here. 
Um, Gender-wise, 51% of you are women, 49% are men. You have about eight years of professional experience on average. This time, 45% of you are trained economists, 34% so are lawyers, and 12% have a background in business. Lastly, 76% of you have a master's degree, while 16% sorry, have a PhD and 8% have a bachelor's degree. So that's the briefing. Now it's time to start and uh, to ask also how our seminar will be structured. So let me just guide you through that. So our speakers will uh, talk about the central topic of today for about 30 minutes. Their talk will be supported by two polls, which will appear on your screen for you to fill in. Following then uh, their presentation, we'll open up the Q&A question where you participants will have a chance to write your questions or comments in the chat box that will appear at the bottom of your screen. So let me now stop here uh, and leave the floor to Brussels. Um, I can see that you've already connected uh, your camera and shared them with the platform. Uh, so uh, the floor is Thank yours. Thank you, Pierre. Thanks again um, for being here. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, with us. Good afternoon, everybody, and apologies for the slight delay. We also had uh, technical issues. Uh, I'm here with uh, Tommy and Andreas, uh, and we are very pleased to present you the banking package today. We have to say it's going to be the tip of the iceberg, because in half an hour to cover the two parts of the huge banking package, uh, it's on, in theory almost mission impossible because if you want to cover the comprehensively both uh, uh, text, uh, both sides, uh, CRD, CRR, and BRD, SRMR, you would technically need at least two times two hours. So we will be touching uh, as much as possible on all issues on the, on the two sides of the package prudential regulation and resolution, and uh, we'll be happy to collect questions. As an additional short word of introduction before I pass the floor to Tommy, I would just like to uh, stress the importance of this banking package in the broad picture for the completion of the banking union and as one of a, an important milestone, as an important risk reduction measure. Uh, that we are trying to uh, achieve uh, to increase the resilience and resolvability of our EU banks, uh, and which we know is an important uh, milestone for the completion of the banking union. We are uh, now, as we speak, still negotiating uh, the common backstop for the single resolution fund. We are also having discussion on liquidity and resolution. And as you know, we still miss the third pillar of the banking union, EDIS. So with this banking package, we are implementing Basel rules, international guidance. We are enhancing resolvability. We are creating a credit hierarchy harmonization. We are having different tools in the, in the toolbox, both on regulatory and resolution side, and this is also complementing other elements of regulatory nature, for example, the NPL backstop. Overall, this is about increasing resilience of the EU banking sector, paving the way for completion of the banking union, and creating a more robust and consistent architecture in the banking union. I think I would stop here and leave it to Tommy for the next uh, uh, slide. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so let me try to give you an overview of the uh, of the prudential part of the of the package uh, to start with. So the first package within the package, if you want, is the um, the measures uh, that implement the Basel standards. Um, one of them is the introduction of a, of a leverage ratio, which provides a backstop to the risk based uh, requirements. So we already had uh, a leverage ratio in CR previously as a reporting and disclosure requirement, and now we introduce it as a capital requirement. It's calibrated at 3% of tier one capital, and there is also a surcharge for G size, 
which is uh, calibrated at 50% of their risk-based uh, buffer. Um, we also have a series of exemptions for activities that could be uh, disproportionately impacted by the leverage ratio. Um, the development banks, our uh, units of development banks, and their uh, public interest lending exposures, uh, officially guaranteed export credits uh, where they have a 0% risk weights. The initial margin for uh, client clearing, uh, so as not to discourage um, central clearing. Uh, we also have a supervisory discretion uh, limited in time in exceptional circumstances to exempt central bank exposure of banks. And we're also exempting uh, the cash balances of the CSDs and CSD banks. We have also a general exemption for CSD, the CCP, sorry. And um, we also have a, a, spe a specific reporting requirement based on averages for large banks uh, to prevent window dressing. Right. The second imp important international standard that we're implementing within the banking package is the net stable funding ratio. Uh, it complements the short-term LCR um, as a liquidity risk uh, management measure. And the NSFR, the idea is more to uh, limit the, mis the maturity mismatch uh, that you can have. Um, here also we're implementing uh, the Basel standard quite faithfully with some limited adjustments uh, mainly to target European specificities, uh, such as cover bonds or uh, trade finance and factoring. Um, we have a transitional arrangement uh, to phase in the calibration for repos and reverse repos, so as not to uh, disrupt uh, market making activities. Um, we also had in the Commission proposal a phase in for derivatives, but the um, the treatment has been reviewed in Basel in the, in the meantime, so we're implementing a more lenient 5% uh, treatment for future funding risk in line with, uh, with the international standard. And uh, here again, we have, uh, we have certain exemptions for CCPs and CSD, CSD banks, only to the extent that they don't perform, perform a significant maturity transformation. Um, third part of the uh, Basel implementation, uh, the new market risk standard. So as you probably know, we had it as a capital requirement in the Commission proposal. Um, in the meantime, uh, Basel decided to review uh, certain features of the, uh, of the market risk standard, uh, notably the, uh, the calibration of the standardized approach. Um, this review was, hasn't been finalized in time for us to incorporate in the banking package. So we decided to uh, have a pragmatic approach and um, to avoid implementing a standard that would be outdated, but at the same time, um, leave time for banks to, uh, to start the preparations. We implemented it as a reporting requirement in the first phase. Um, the parts that have just been decided at international level uh, in January will be now uh, introduced via delegated acts or RTSs. Um, and we will turn it into a capital requirement uh, in the framework of our upcoming uh, proposal on the next review of CR and CRD. So in the meantime, in parallel to the reporting requirements, uh, you still have the existing capital requirements that is based on the, uh, the current CR. And finally, for international standards, credit risk. So there we, we didn't have a, a comprehensive uh, review of the framework that will come in the next package, uh, but only um, very targeted amendments for specific situations, um, such as a possibility to exclude the impact of massive disposal of defaulted loans from uh, internal model calculations, uh, very framed exemptions to uh, incentivize banks to get rid of the uh, legacy assets. So it's only a temporary, um, temporary possibility um, and all the rules, all the other rules on internal models will continue to apply. The adjustment is very limited to the additional loss that the massive disposal itself uh, would, uh, would bring. Um, and it can only, uh, banks can only benefit if they get rid of at least 20% of, uh, of their portfolio of defaulted exposures. Um, another targeted amendment in the credit risk framework is a specific calibration 
for loans backed by salary and pension payments, which uh, we were shown uh, have uh, less risk than uh, the general uh, retail exposures. So proportionality, you. so reduction in uh, administrative cost and compliance cost for smaller banks um, with a cost benefit analysis on reporting requirements with uh, ambitious uh, cost reduction targets, uh, a feasibility study to integrate the reporting of prudential resolution and statistical data, and more proportionate uh, disclosure requirement for small banks, which in certain cases would be limited to only key metrics. And uh, the second aspect is the when we, that we, we introduce uh, more complex uh, standards, we also have uh, simplified methods for smaller banks or banks that are less engaged in certain type of activities. Uh, we have it for the NSFR, we have it for market risk, and we have it also for the new standards on counterparty credit risk and interest rate risk. Right, so next to risk reduction and proportionality, contribution to growth and our CMU projects. Uh, one thing that we did is uh, we introduced the sustainable finance dimension in bank regulation for the first time, uh, carefully so as not to uh, undermine the prudential standards. So we have two interesting reports that will come up from the EBA. One on a green supporting factor, brown penalizing factor, so differentiated risk rate in function of the environmental and social impacts of assets, and one on the possible inclusion of in environmental and social consideration in SREP, and we also have a disclosure requirement for large banks. We also try to enhance the capacity of banks to lend to SMEs with an SME supporting factor that has been extended, and uh, their capacity to fund infrastructure projects um, with a discount, capital discount for high quality projects. Uh, another big chunk is the um, clarification and enhancement of uh, certain governance and supervision uh, measures. Uh, the most important one being um, the clarification of the Pillar 2 framework, which is confined um, to institution-specific cases and not uh, macroprudential cases anymore. And uh, at the same time, we introduced the distinction in regulation between requirements and guidance. So to compensate for the confinement of a of the pillar two to microprudential uh, aspects, we also um, gave more flexibility in the uh, microprudential toolbox with a sectoral use of the systemic risk buffer, an increased cap on the outside buffer, including for subsidiaries, uh, but with a uh, commission authorization when you reach a certain level. Uh, we also have uh, a requirement to establish an IPU for uh, third country groups that have large activities in the EU with a threshold at 40 billion. Uh, initially, we envisaged to have it for all GSIs uh, in the Commission proposal, but in the end, it's based on the, on the size of the European activities only. Um, and uh, we have a transition period for, for third country groups to get ready to that of, of three years. We enhance the reporting and the coordination and supervision of third country branches. And we will have a report by the EBA on the general framework for third country branches uh, becoming. We have a supervisory approval and supervision of financial holdings and mixed financial holdings. And we also made changes in the way the consolidating supervisor is determined. Um, some improvements on the uh, prudential side of the uh, fight against money laundering. So we enhance the cooperation and exchange of information between the prudential supervisors and AML authorities. And we strengthen the AML dimension in certain uh, important prudential tools, such as the SREP, uh, the authorization procedure, and uh, the fit and proper checks. And also, um, we introduced um, proportionality in remuneration rules uh, with certain rules that are too burdensome for smaller banks, such as uh, payout and instruments and deferrals, uh, were um, are not applicable to them anymore. Uh, integration of the EU banking sector is an area where we we had hoped we could be more ambitious. So, you know, as the as Commission, we propose cross-border waivers 
um, for liquidity capital and on the uh, resolution side uh, as well. Uh, but we had uh, strong concerns uh, for the financial stability of host member states. So that's something uh, that couldn't be done at this stage. Uh, what we managed to achieve uh, in the integration uh, part, let's say, is uh, to have the banking union uh, considered as a single geographic area when you compute the GSI score, so that you don't have a disincentive for cross-border uh, activity within the banking union for those banks. And uh, before we go to the resolution part, so um, say miscellaneous, uh, a series of changes to the uh, on-fund rules on the non-deduction of software. Uh, we also extended some transitional arrangements uh, for the insurance holdings of banks. Um, more adapted rules for uh, issuances abroad for uh, groups that have an MP, multiple point of entry resolution strategy, and uh, rec recognition of profit and loss transfer agreements in CT1, as well as payouts from national reserves. Uh, and as I mentioned already earlier, so basal standards are implemented for counterparty credit risk, exposure to CCPs, large exposures, interest rate risk, and also some additional exemptions for uh, certain banks, mostly development banks or credit union, from the overall scope of the regulation in the directive. I'm handing it over to you now. Thank you, Tommy, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Um, I will uh, present the revisions to the MRO framework uh, that were included in the banking package. Uh, before I start talking about the revisions themselves, I would like just to say a few words about MRL as it applies today. Uh, most of you will know that MRL is not a new requirement in the EU. In fact, it is in force since uh, 2015 when the EU resolution framework became effective. Uh, and uh, what is important to emphasize is that in the EU, all banks are subject to MRL. And, um, MRL is determined on the, on the, on the basis of the bank-specific assessment by the resolution authority, uh, meaning that there is no harmonized minimum level of MRL requirement uh, currently. Now, with the banking package, uh, some very important amendments to the MRL framework are being introduced uh, with, the, uh, with the intention to make it more effective and also to align the MRL framework more with the international TLEC standard, which is also being implemented uh, in the EU uh, MRL framework. Now, speaking about uh, overall calibration of uh, MRL, the structure of the requirement, uh, the structure is uh, conceptually very similar. Uh, so MRL is composed of two major parts, the loss absorption part, uh, loss absorption amount, and recapitalization amount. Uh, loss absorption amount uh, uh, cannot be adjusted by resolution authorities. It, it is the sum of a prudential pillar one requirement and prudential pillar two requirement for the bank. Uh, recapitalization amount, uh, the purpose of this amount is to ensure that uh, bank complies with its uh, continuing authorization requirements after resolution. So the recapitalization amount does take into account uh, the size of the bank uh, after the expected size of the bank after resolution, after the application of land resolution uh, tools. Also, uh, recapitalization amount uh, may include uh, a market confidence buffer at uh, discretion of resolution authorities. And the uh, default amount of market confidence buffer is first uh, to the uh, level of combined capital buffer requirement less the counter cyclical buffer element. Uh, as I mentioned before, um, uh, current MRL framework does not include any harmonized minimum levels for any banks. Now, this is the part that is changing uh, dramatically with the banking package. Um, GSIIs uh, will be subject uh, to a minimum uh, harmonized level of MRL, and this uh, is uh, driven by the implementation of the TLEC standard. Now I will just try to uh, enable a pointer so that uh, you will see more clearly uh, what I'm talking about. So 
this formula uh, represents the uh, pillar one requirement or the minimum uh, harmonized level of MRL for GCs. Uh, the first two legs of the formula correspond with the TLEC standard. Um, in the EU transposition, we also introduce a third leg into this minimum level, which is 8% of uh, total liabilities and own funds. Uh, GCs are not going to be the only banks that will be subject to uh, minimum level of MRL. Uh, the package uh, includes a rule that the so-called top-tier banks, which are defined as banks where the resolution group assets are in excess of 100 billion euro, would also be subject to a uh, Pillar 1 MRL. The calibration of uh, Pillar 1 MRL for top-tier banks uh, is a little bit lower, uh, taking into account that systemically they are a little bit less uh, uh, important than GCs. However, they are still, uh, the three legs um, uh, are based on um, risk weighted asset calibration, uh, leverage ratio exposure calibration, and uh, also a third leg is uh, 8% um, of uh, total liabilities and on funds. Um, resolution authorities will have a discretion to uh, extend the scope of uh, top tier banks by also subjecting banks which are uh, smaller than 100 billion euro in size to the same treatment. Uh, if resolution authorities deem that uh, those uh, banks, in case of their failure, uh, would pose uh, systemic risk. So um, those banks. Uh, are referred to people who worked on the uh, on the legislation as uh, fish banks, uh, in the sense that uh, resolution authorities will be able to fish those banks from below the 100 billion euro threshold and subject them to the same uh, pillar one uh, harmonized minimum requirement as top tier banks. Uh, what is important to mention, uh, talking about the uh, pillar one minima, is that these minima would have to be met with uh, subordinated instruments. Uh, which is a very important uh, new element uh, uh, of the banking package uh, and of the new MRL framework. Now, um, resolution authorities will also have a discretion for GCs, top tier banks, and the so-called fish banks to ask for more subordination in excess of those pillar one uh, uh, minima that you see on the screen. Uh, but uh, subject to conditions, uh, uh, because the pillar one levels are already relatively high. Uh, so this uh, additional conditionality, therefore, is a little bit um, both quantitative and qualitative. Uh, you'll see it on the screen. So in interest of time, I, uh, I will not go through it. And uh, with respect to banks which are neither GCs, uh, top tier banks, or fish banks, the determination of subordinated part of MRL uh, will uh, remain being uh, uh, on a case by case assessment of uh, resolution authorities. And it will be driven uh, with the aim to ensure that the no creditor Warsaw principle in resolution is respected. Now, summing up uh, the uh, information that I just went through, uh, the, uh, we, we included in our presentation uh, a stylization here. So you see two stacks here represented, one calibration of MRL or TLAC on the basis of risk weighted assets, and the other one on the basis of leverage ratio exposure measure. So now, now uh, the first observation is that both of these requirements banks will have to comply with uh, in parallel and effectively whichever produces a uh, whichever for that particular bank is uh, is a higher one will become in, uh, in reality the binding one. Uh, the second observation is that uh, let's say if you look at the just the calibration of MRL TLAC uh, on the basis of risk weighted assets in isolation you could see that uh, uh, TLAC versus MRL um, could vary. In this particular um, example, MRL for this bank would be higher than the TLAC calibration. And uh, in reality, this uh, relationship will depend uh, on the, uh, let's say, uh, pillar 2R prudential requirement of that bank. Uh, 
on the resolution tools which are foreseen uh, in the resolution plan and how the bank would look uh, after the resolution. Therefore, what would be the recapitalization amount of that bank? So um, that's an element, uh, important element to keep in mind. Now, uh, a third observation is that, of course, um, uh, it will also vary uh, from bank to bank whether a risk-weighted asset calibration or uh, calibration on the basis of uh, leverage ratio exposure measure will be binding. And here, um, a lot will depend on the uh, nature of exposures uh, of the bank, and in particular on the average risk weight uh, of a bank uh, uh, and banks with in particular lower average risk weights uh, could be expected to have uh, MRL when calibrated on leverage ratio exposure measure to be a binding uh, uh, MRL uh, requirement. And the, uh, the fourth and the last observation to stress here is that um, uh, when we talk about calibration of MRL on the risk weighted asset basis, the uh, combined capital buffer requirement, the risk based capital uh, combined capital buffer requirement, will stack on top of the of the uh, MRL RT lag. So that's what you see uh, with the uh, uh, with the green. Uh, I'm just trying to show it. This is the uh, combined capital buffer requirement. Uh, stacking on top of the MRL, which is the sum of the blue and the uh, yellow box. A few words about uh, eligibility criteria uh, for TLAC and MRL. Um, eligibility criteria generally for the MRL framework are strengthened very um, significantly because uh, they are now based on the eligibility criteria for TLAG standard. And uh, just a few words, uh, first of all, therefore, what uh, will be the eligible uh, instruments that banks could use to comply with TLAG standard itself. Uh, that will be on funds, uh, amortized parts of tier two, which are not recognized as on funds, and of course, uh, eligible liabilities. And uh, there it is important to stress that eligible liabilities for the most part will have to be subordinated, uh, but uh, there is a possibility to use uh, uh, certain um, uh, to, to use a certain amount of non-subordinated instruments. Um, so I think I covered fully eligibility criteria for TLAC. Now, uh, eligibility criteria for MRL are a little bit uh, broader, uh, but in essence, they are, um, um, for the most criteria, they are the same as uh, the criteria for TLAC, except that uh, there is no strict requirement of uh, subordination. Um, uh, the the um, uh, eligibility, eligibility criteria for MRL also include a possibility to use uh, structured notes um, that uh, that meet certain specific conditions. And also there is a possibility uh, to use up to a certain uh, limit uh, the uh, eligible instruments that have been issued by subsidiaries uh, uh, within the same resolution group. But again, there are some uh, specific conditions that apply. And um, speaking about the internal MRL, uh, I think it is important to emphasize that eligibility criteria for internal MRL are slightly different uh, in view of the nature of the internal MRL. And there I would uh, outline uh, two of them. One of them is that uh, internal MRL has to be issued by subsidiary to its resolution entity, uh, either directly or indirectly uh, through other entities in the same uh, resolution group. And uh, the second important feature of internal MRL is that uh, it has to be fully subordinated uh, to any uh, instruments that are issued by the subsidiary to uh, investors outside the resolution group. And uh, a few words on the allocation of MRL capacity within groups. Uh, uh, this is a sensitive area, and I understand that you already launched a poll question in, in relation to this slide. 
now decisions on how MRL capacity should be allocated uh, in a group uh, are taken by the Resolution College, uh, where the resolution authorities of uh, entities uh, are uh, present. Uh, uh, first expectation is that there would be a joint decision on both uh, external and all the internal MRLs uh, achieved uh, together. If that does not materialize, if there is no such joint decision, then uh, first internal MRLs would have to be decided by uh, the host resolution authorities, uh, and this would be followed by a decision on external MRL by the group level resolution authority. Um, what is important to stress is that on a cross border basis, um, uh, internal MRL has to be fully prepositioned with the subsidiary. So the prepositioning is at 100%. This 100% uh, could go down only in cases where both subsidiary and the resolution entity are established in the same member state if uh, waivers or collateralized guarantees are applied in such cases. And there is uh, a little uh, chart uh, shown on the slide where you could see on the most left side column the situation on the cross-border basis where prepositioning, which is shown in blue color, is 100%. Whereas the three columns uh, on the right side show different possible combinations uh, of MRL positioning in the same member state. So depending on whether uh, collateralized guarantees are accepted partially or fully, or if there is a waiver from MRL requirement uh, which has been granted by the uh, resolution authority. And I, okay, one last slide, then I think we can stop at that. Uh, uh, important uh, information, I guess, for many stakeholders about how these different requirements apply. So the uh, banking package was published on 7th of June in the official journal. Uh, uh, the legislation uh, enters into force. So uh, may I just, with, with the interest of uh, also discussing a few of the points that you've raised. Uh, so the slides are going to be available to participants uh, um, after after the events. And so I would suggest that the it would be a good moment. I know that you couldn't cover all the aspects, all the slides that you, you wanted to cover today, but given the technical, uh, small technical issues we experienced, I would just suggest that we have uh, five more minutes um, that we dedicate them to the uh, questions and that you engage with a few of those questions. We can select two. Uh, so sorry for interrupting in, in the flow of your presentation, but I would think that this is probably the best uh, use also of the time of our participants. Um, so I don't know if you could have a, a look at the various contributions. Uh, thank you, Sian, for uh, enlarging the view. There have been different questions on uh, leverage ratios. Um, the question on sustainable finance, we provided a bit of background, so I think that should be uh, that should be considered in some way as as treated. Um, and they were again finishing on, on uh, the distinction between uh, resolution strategies for MP and SPE. Um, so once you're back online, I would invite you to perhaps engage with uh, the question on um, the internal and external MREL, uh, which I think has uh, so far uh, sparked quite some, some debate and there is a need for clarif clarification. Okay, so the dis distinction between um, uh, internal and external MREL, maybe here we should start with the um, a few uh, steps back uh, of another change which is also introduced in the banking package, which I did not cover in the slides, is that um, there is very important new terminology introduced uh, in the banking package, which helps to oper operationalize the single point of entry uh, resolution strategy. And um, uh, banks, uh, resolution plans would have to identify which of the entities in the banking group are so-called uh, resolution resolution entities and which uh, entities in the group are not resolution entities. So resolution entities will be those to which um, 
uh, resolution plan, uh, resolution tools are planned to be applied, including uh, Berlin. And therefore, resolution entities will be those entities that will be subject to external MRL. Now, subsidiaries of resolution entities, uh, I think I mentioned this uh, uh, shortly, will be subject to internal MRL, and then they will issue instruments to comply with uh, internal MRL, uh, either directly to their resolution entity or through or indirectly via other entities, but in the same resolution group. Um, so that is uh, kind of the conceptual distinction between uh, uh, what we mean by external MRL and uh, internal MRL. So I think that Marie you wanted to step in. No, I just wanted maybe to come to comment briefly on the poll question that we posted regarding internal MRL. Um, I think the views are quite nicely split. Uh, I mean, we, we, if I recall properly, because I can't see it on the screen anymore, we are 26% yes, 26% no, and 48% uh, in the middle, which is which was a conditional yes. I think this question is very um, prospective uh, indeed on on, uh, on on the avenues that uh, could be explored looking forward. Uh, as as Andreas has explained now, the results of the negotiation of the banking package have uh, resulted in a quite high level of prepositioning of internal MRL within the EU, higher than what was the uh, international requirement of uh, TLAC and FSB. And uh, there is ongoing uh, reflection on, on, on why. And, and we know that it's a question important for industry. It's a question very important for host member states. And uh, so I think it's very interesting for us to see that uh, already today in the poll question, about half of the participants uh, underline the need to reflect on those mechanisms and additional condition uh, to uh, uh, regarding the availability and enforceability uh, of of uh, the internal MRL or the, the the location of the MRL. So, thank you for that feedback, and it, it will certainly feed our reflection looking forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think we will just deal with uh, last question. There was a question on which was very specific and a bit more advanced maybe. Uh, is the T1 used to meet the leverage ratio requirement surcharge TLAC MREL eligible? Uh, we would need to check that it's a very technical question. So maybe the, it's not probably the best uh, time to get into that level of detail. One question by Philippe Anunciata was about how are smaller banks defined? So you have a definition which is actually uh, small and non-complex banks. So, so you have a size, Catherine, uh, balance sheet size, and um, and you also have some criteria for non uh, non-complex. So they, um, you have limits um, on the uh, market risk, on the derivative exposures. Uh, that these banks can take There's a series of of, uh, of criteria, which is uh, which is quite long. Um, but so it's both size and and complexity. Uh, thank you so much. So there have been a, a few turbulences, but I think nevertheless, uh, and thank you to, to thanks to the patience of uh, all our participants and our speakers, um, we reached the end. And I think that it was a very helpful uh, presentation and, and insightful presentation on the on the package itself, uh, which um, is a challenge indeed to capture. But I think we can. We're now uh, all are convinced that we can frame it uh, as a package. No, it's not. It's not a joke. Uh, there is a real reason behind it: uh, the diversity and the density of topics which are which are tackled. Uh, so I'd like to thank you all for, for being with us. Um, the seminar is now uh, drawing to a close. There will be other seminars uh, over the next months uh, at the Florence School of Banking and Finance. Uh, and as we mentioned in the past, the recordings of seminars are always uh, available on our website. And uh, we will make sure, of course, uh, due to some of the interruptions that you will receive uh, the slides once as they've been approved um, for circulation, 
uh, and uh, I think that's it. I wish you a very good afternoon.